evaluating escape rooms in education. Really pleased to have such a distinguished panel join us um, and delighted to welcome them all back. These were all speakers at last year's Escape Room Showcase and they've so graciously agreed to come back um, and join us today. So let me introduce our panel. Um, we have Nick Witten, um, who's a professor of digital learning and play at Northumbria University. We have Jenny Moffat, who's an educationalist and faculty faculty developer at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. We have Brianna Morell, who's an associate prof at the University of Indianapolis. We have Inga Dukervert, who's a member of Zerti Learning at D-Learning. We have Rachelle Emily Rowlinson, who's a senior learning designer at the University of Durham. And we have Pangiotis Fataris, who's a principal lecturer at the Uni of Brighton. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Now, let's kick off with these questions. Could we start with, can you tell us about your first experience of evaluating escape rooms? Particularly interested to know, what did you focus on? So was it about how the learning outcomes were met? Was it the user engagement? Was it the ease of design or something else? Jenny, you're giving me that look. Would you like to kick off? Who goes first? Who goes first? Um, well, I suppose. Uh, where do I start with this one? Um, so the escape room that we created at RCSI is an educational an online education escape room and um, that helps students to manage uncertainty. And we were really lucky to get some funding to create that using a design based research approach. So that meant that we were uh, prototyping the escape room, testing it, iterating, testing again. So we did actually go through a huge range of different evaluations. Um, so I would say the things that we used uh, when we had the very early prototypes, we used more qualitative data collection methods. So um, we would play test um observe you know sit in as the facilitator and observe the play test and then do a focus group afterwards on you know a couple of the key things about the room itself and then as the iterations became more sophisticated then we moved into different kind of um survey tools and actually brianna uh, yourself and heidi your uh, escape room evaluation tool was really really useful um we also because we were looking at uncertainty we used a range of um kind of psychometric tools that aim to see if there was a change in the student's tolerance for uncertainty. And then the other thing that was really fun as well was actually recording them play in the breakout rooms and then watching the videos back, which, you know, it is time consuming, but I would say it was an awful lot of fun to actually see the students engage with it. Um, and, and when they're online and in a breakout room, they completely forget that they're being recorded. So um, you get some really rich data and what works, what doesn't work. And one of the things we were very interested in was how learning was taking place. So we took um, the community of inquiry pedagogy and we took a framework from that and analysed the actions and interactions, um, you know, what they did and what they said uh, as they played in relation to community of inquiry. So that gave us some really nice data as well. Now, I would say that's probably you know, much more in depth than most people need to go. But what I would say is that there's, you know, many, many ways in which you can evaluate it. It's, it's about what's really important. What What is the data that you want to know about? Thanks, Jenny. Um, Nick, I saw you nodding away. Do you want to maybe come in? Yeah, certainly. So um, my experience with escape rooms has been slightly different in that I'm really focused on what students can learn from making escape rooms rather than playing them. Um, so a lot of the work that I've been done is around, again, very qualitative because it's been very small scale groups. And I'm particularly interested in the experience of failure and building resilience through the process of game making itself. So, again, quite a lot of qualitative, quite a lot of observation. I am interested in the sort of bigger impact that um, you get from learning interventions. But as with all sorts of game based learning, I always worry that how much genuine impact can we expect from something that takes an hour? You know, what can we actually really evidence in terms because, you know, unless it's the most engaging or something very important about that hour, actually most of us don't learn very much in an hour. So I kind of move away from that to, to sort of, again, 
things like the experience, the confidence, but I, I'd be much more interested in kind of seeing the impacts and the evaluation of escape rooms over longer periods rather than just kind of here's one escape room. But we'll, because I just don't think that we can necessarily expect any one hour experience to have that kind of impact. <clears throat> That's a really interesting point. Inga, I can see your mic's on. Did you want to chip in? Um, yeah, um, I agree with uh, Nick. I'm also more on the practical side of escape rooms um, and we uh, uh, help people build escape rooms in Zurti. Um, and then I'm, it's mostly co-working. Uh, co we work on, together with the, uh, the people that know the content and know the goals uh, and we help them to build it. So what we really what we do with evaluation is more on the practical side. Does it work? Does all the links work? Don't they get stuck in somewhere because then they will be um, uh, uh, stopping and the whole escape room is stopping. So, um, and then uh, they, tr they play it with the uh, students and then we get feedback. Okay, uh, we have to change this or they didn't learn anything from that. and. And then you're going to make the escape room much more rich um, and uh, much more um, useful for the goal that they have. So it's more on the practical side of it. Thanks, Inga. Brianna, I think you were going to chip in. Sure. So my experience with escape rooms started in 2017 when I had a master's student who I tasked with the um, opportunity to create a review activity that was more engaging than the very boring Jeopardy style game that we had in which one person answered and everyone else sat and watched. So um, we did our first kind of breakout box kind of concept then. And so I think initially it's really probably as many people find very informal evaluation where you realize, oh, this really easy crossword actually takes 45 minutes. And so that's not going to work and people are getting frustrated. So we did kind of that, you know, um, the iteration that happens with that and starting with something easy and watching engagement and those kinds of things as well. With my groups, I have large groups of students all working at the same time in a classroom. So it's more of kind of the breakout box, perhaps concept um, in many of the rooms. So I've done different things in which they use across the room or then collaborate together as well. Um, so so I am there as well. So some of my evaluation is kind of that observational type thing and seeing how teams are doing together as far as team numbers, when the social loafing seems to occur, when student groups seem to give up. I usually I very rarely have one group perhaps that gives up and they just start trying numbers uh, to try to get through things. Um, I have also done some evaluation with knowledge improvement, but again, it, it was a small group, I will say, and there did seem to be some growth. And I did have some um, experts review the questions, you know, for um, validity and stuff as well. But Again, it's hard to know that those things will improve just with one experience. And so I think that is a way to continue to um, improve uh, those things as well. What I do tend to find as well as a lot of students will indicate, I know now what I need to study for finals because mine tended to be reviewed before finals. And so they realize what they don't know, which is also a great finding. Um, other things I've done are with focus groups. I had a colleague that was not involved in the escape room do some focus groups. And so a lot of that soft skill um, use during the escape room. I don't know that they necessarily developed soft skills during that, but were able to use soft skills. Again, I don't know that you can just all of a sudden um, develop them in an hour, but the concept of um, collaboration, of speaking out what you think you know, of explaining your response of explaining why someone else is probably incorrect um, of asking for help um, and also in in my field of nursing time sensitivity is important and asking for help all of those things are really important so it would tend to be somewhat what that as well and so um, sometimes as we and some of the previous presentations have talked about the importance of the experience of the game and the learning um, sometimes we do toe that line and at sometimes in my semester when we do it, sometimes it is uh, something that's a little bit different and, and fun that to keep them engaged when they've kind of lost interest. Um, and then also I have uh, collaborated with Heidi Eugle in her um, escape room perception skill and adapted that to my topic area as well, which some may have seen too. And so that has provided some evaluation. So I will stop there. I could keep going. Thank you though. Thanks, Brianna. That's really interesting. Um, Rochelle um, Pangiotis, would either of you like to chip in or shall I give you the next question? 
I'm happy to chip in. Um, so possibly a slightly different way of answering this question. But uh, the first escape room that I evaluated, I thought I was really clever because I actually put the evaluation form in the escape room. Um, so I was able to get a gauge at the start of where people felt they were at. And then I was able to get them to give me some feedback at the end. Um, and to me, that was like super clever. I kind of feel like that backfired though, because they evaluated me more so than I evaluated them, which meant a bit of a shift in the way that I thought about things and the way the kind of things I wanted to look at. So I have, and I don't know if others have experienced this as well, but I've come across some groups that like to cheat. Um, and I recognise this as an opportunity to sort of explore that lateral thinking and the sort of cheating, subterfuge, those kind of things within an escape room context. Um, so it's shifted the way I evaluate in the sense that I now want to see the different paths people are taking. So the thing that I'm looking at is less so whether or not they're meeting a learning outcome, but it's how they're getting from the learning outcome through the activity to whatever it is at the other end. Um, so yeah, the, the evaluation kind of shifted the way that I think about it, which all kind of winds up. It's a really interesting point of reflection. Thanks, Rochelle. And Jotis? Yeah. So uh, I'll try to be brief because I know there are more questions. So what we did is we tried to hit, you know, two birds with one stone. So uh, there's this module, master's course, module called design thinking. So what we asked students was actually to design an escape room, an educational escape room, because they had to apply design thinking principles, you know, to design that. And we also wanted them to... Uh, improve the soft skills because in the UX industry is really important to, you know, to talk to people, have those kind of soft skills. So that was the main idea behind this. But at the same time, the escape rooms were, were focusing on cybersecurity because again, that's a very, uh, something everybody needs to know about that. So uh, we also uh, did a pre post and delay post test with regard to cybersecurity. So that is how we evaluated whether they knew they learned anything about cybersecurity. But as for the, the practical thing about, you know, applying all the design thinking principles to design the, the escape room, we use more uh, qualitative methods. So, you know, focus groups, discussions, and because that thing happened throughout whole semester, they were developing this for you for, I don't know how many weeks, that's it's about 10, 12 weeks. So we had, they had plenty of time to do interviews and focus groups and all of that. And overall, yeah, we're quite happy with those results. That's also why we've been doing this for since 2018, the same approach. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the next question, what methodology have you used that's achieved the richest results? Brianna, you're nodding away. Shall we come to you? <laughs> I was looking at everyone else, but sure. I think um, the focus groups, I think, were um, really rich to hear from the students what they experienced. Uh, it is always a bit of a challenge to get a good sample of, of students. Initially, I thought I had a large number of people. I think they thought it was just an additional session they were signing up for rather than a focus group. Um, but I think that was neat early on because this was several years ago that, that this was coming about. And finding them talk about the things that we hoped that they were learning or we seemed to informally uh, see that we thought that they were learning. Um, so that was a, a neat thing I think that would probably be the richest results that we found. Thank you. And um, Nick? Again, I probably um, covered this previously, but for me it's about talking to people either in focus groups or interviews, potentially without the per being separate. When, when I've done it with students, it's I've tried to not be the person getting that data mm -hmm. just because I think it gives a more realistic students sometimes sometimes bizarrely want to be polite or think they might be graded on it so actually having somebody external do that um and then watching students play although i think there is this kind of ethical issue about what are we watching are we watching for learning and how much can you infer from that what i'd really like to do if i ever get back to researching this would be to ask students to watch themselves um play and then kind of reflect on that and look at that 
Thanks. That's such an important point about that almost independence in that evaluation. As you say, the risk of students thinking it's impacting marks if it's contributing to marks. Yeah, that's something we need to guard against. Um, Rochelle, shall I come to you? Sure. Um, similar, really. I think as many opportunities to talk to people as like is the best option, really. Um, I'm quite fascinated by this idea that if you go to a commercial escape room, you have, I think, do they call them like game leaders or they have like a really fancy title and they get to watch all of the games and give the clues and things like that. Um, I'd really love to be in a position to try and take that kind of role on and then take it a step further, like Nick says, and get them to look back at their games master thank you very much um yeah then look back at their own progress and sort of find out a bit about what's happening at this point what was it that you were finding frustrating like why are you asking for a clue here um so i, I do think there's some scope here for some interesting um shall we say method methodological changes and taking a more playful approach to how we gather that data um, so not necessarily talking from experience more talking towards where I'd like to be yeah I'm picking up in some of the sessions earlier that potential building for our students that a role for students to be given sure. yeah Inga Panagiotis Jenny any of you want to join in uh, I'll be happy to go next so uh what we do is um, we ask students, first of all, to present because they designed the game. We ask them to give a presentation going through you know, everything that happened uh, while they were designing the game. And then we play test the game following the Think Aloud protocol. So we just tell them exactly what goes in our head and they can sense our frustrations and you know, when we feel happy and everything like that. And then we follow that with a focus group discussion when we discuss about everything. So they've, ex they've experienced our real uh, and brutally honest experience there and feedback. And then we discuss talking about the lessons learned, why they did whatever they did that way. So that is how, uh, and apparently that seems to be working fine based on the feedback we got from the students. Thank you. Jenny, you're nodding away there. Oh, just to say that um, uh, what you've mentioned there, Pangeata, so I, I, it, it, it links into another question, um, but yeah, I can totally relate to that. But I'm just thinking um, the one data collection that we haven't mentioned yet that I thought was really great was the Think Aloud protocol. So whenever you have the game and you let your users, again, it's design thinking. So um, letting the users play around with the game from a very early stage, even just uh, to start out with the puzzles and watching them talk through what that experience is like for them because again I think like the magic of escape games is that you want to create uh interactions that are fun they're engaging they're maybe humorous and you never know how that's going to hit without the testing so when people are testing it and describing what they're experiencing as they move through the puzzles or the overall theme um it really helps because uh you know again otherwise we're kind of stuck in our heads about what the game should be doing, but then our users, if they tell us at a very early stage what it is actually doing, um, you know, can correct us very early on. Thanks, Jenny. So um, before I move on to the next question, just for our participants, um, I can see we've got quite a few questions in the chat about general um, escape room, and I will pick some of those up at the end with the permission of the panel. But for now, we'll keep that focus on evaluation. So do you have any top tips on things to um, avoid when starting out evaluating your escape room? And I know some of you have touched on things that you maybe would have done differently um, if you did it now or are doing it now. Could I come in on that one? Because I just remembered the point I wanted to relate back to Panagiotis, what you, you were saying there about the, the reflective activity afterwards, you know. So I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned through all of this is that, you know, you're jumping in to evaluate the game. But what I've realised now, when we roll the game out with our medical students, it's the whole shebang. It's the, the pre-briefing, the game and the debriefing. So when you're evaluating it, you know, the learning often isn't happening in the game itself it's happening in the debriefing afterwards so if you're constantly evaluating 
just the game you're missing out on where the learning is happening so uh, just while it's in my head I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned Thanks Jenny and maybe plays into next point as well about timing that you know if we're evaluating them immediately are they going to have time to actually process what they've been doing? I haven't done this but tagging along with that I when I have students my my and my ones that I've used in my professional job um, have been towards the end of the semester and use a lot of the things that they've used throughout the whole semester. So there is sometimes that self-evaluation the student has of their own learning and the things that they have yet to learn or reinforce or refresh. So it would be curious to really see what it is they did after that. Did they actually go back to those topics to review and refresh them? And did that work effectively? Did the, the game provide any guidance on how to proceed in that learning as well? I think that would be a curious topic to investigate. I do think it's also helpful to consider if you're going to consider evaluation that you consider, um, you know, review for um, IRB approval if you're at all considering publishing it because sometimes you then find this really rich data and then you can't do anything with it if you haven't thought of that beforehand. So that's one thing to consider, though not everything is a study. So perhaps it's a give it a pilot and then you know you could you could do research too but sometimes that is a, a problem i find is having enough time both to do to create an escape room to pilot it to improve it um and then tagging on sometimes some assessment or evaluation that then is not useful beyond yourself so something to consider and nick you were also touching on that ethics question do you maybe want to chip in as well yeah, so I suppose I, I guess one of the things that I learned was that students are often or people are very often really happy to participate in the in escape room or to make an escape room and they're often happy to do the debrief. Um, but it's also whether how you can do an evaluation then that is fair and ethical, because as soon as you get into the whole side of having to fill out forms and get ethical approval and it, it it then becomes a very diff different thing and it's kind of thinking about the types of research that we do or the types of evaluation that we do as teachers on our students day to day to get feedback on making a course better and the type of evaluation that we would do if we wanted to publish it they're kind of very different things and I think it's just so much I think so much over evaluation goes on in terms of potentially getting lots of ethical approval for things that are then just going to be used to not just but are going to be used primarily or solely to improve education um and sometimes things can just be fun and i think so i think we just need to be careful about everything doesn't need to be published um and making evaluation light touch and meaningful um again sort of separate to this we've done some stuff around again with the playful learning association and the conference about how you can make evaluation fun and I really like the idea that sort of Rochelle was saying about building it into the game. Is there a way to do that so that potentially the evaluation is part of the escape room itself? I'll probably probably need Liz to come, just probably come up with loads of ways of doing that. Um, but yeah, that was just a kind of off the cuff thought. Rochelle, you talked about, you know, your reflections early on. Do you have any top tips now that you're a bit further on in your journey? Sure. So I think it's really important to look towards principles from game design as much as we can. So similar to what other people have said as well, but just the idea of iterating and like genuinely, if you are planning an activity, try get it, you know, 50 percent of the way there in terms of planning and then start to evaluate the activity. I think that is something that you can bring students in on as well, like there are ways of doing that. Um, some of my students are staff, which makes it a little bit more complicated, um, but I think it's a really important thing about things like, you know, teaching people how to evaluate their own work and their own practice and reflect is actually to go, this is how I am designing something and I want you to understand my design process. Um, I think it's probably easier for me to say that as a learning designer because I put a lot of that into the work I do anyway. But I guess echo what Nick said in terms of not treating everything as an evaluation. 
some activities can just be for, for fun. Some activities might be for an assessment and it's recognising that you can have different types of activities as well. Um, and other than that, just a reminder of when you're doing anything like this, test it and keep testing it and then test it again. Um, I have managed to get myself a bit of a reputation as someone who gets themselves locked in their own escape room. The first time that happened was unfortunately in front of like a group of professionals at a keynote keynote talk. So when I say test, I mean test and not in that kind of environment because that was kind of stressful. <laughs> and then I that online group that Liz was talking about earlier. If, okay, if, if, for you. Sorry, Brian, I cut over you. No, that's fine. I agree. I was just thinking too of um, the number of times I've tested locks over and over and over and then still found even just this last week it was wrong. Or now I have a motion lock that has locked me out and I, I that could be an infinite number of things. So I uh, could say a prayer for me. Um, and now they, they've discontinued production, so they're $50. So maybe I just give up and buy another one. But um, I was thinking too with testing, uh, one way that I've found to do that is with other faculty who are interested in escape rooms. It gives them a way of learning about escape room design and asking questions and things as well. I also have had our older students or graduating students have to have so many professional practice hour, like um, hours and learning kind of more about their profession, I guess. And so that could count as that. And so they have done the escape room and it's a great refresh for them as well on content that they've learned previously, but it's been a little bit. Um, and then they also seem to be a little bit more willing to give that advice. And I think the concept of asking for advice rather than feedback sometimes is helpful um, to give some input. And then I've also had, I do escape room, I do one for a local church and I've done um, one for a high school camp at our university. And so having those leaders also do it because they know that that learner um, which is a different learner than a, a college student like mine. And so would those those student learners um, understand those tasks? And then it also gives them a better understanding of the escape room so that when they facilitate it, they also know uh, how to provide appropriate helps to the uh, participants. Thanks, Brianna. Some fabulous tips in there. Inga, I'm aware that we lost you for a while, but I think you're back. Do you want to comment on top tips to avoid when evaluating? I think we might still be having some tech issues there. Perhaps Claire or Suzanne can help or please use the chat. Oh, no, there we are. OK, Inga. yes, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I totally agree with Rochelle uh, on test, test, test. I've been there as well, <laughs> like we all, I think. Um, and there's one thing that I, I like to add as a tip, uh, but it's more for the creators of the escape rooms and not for um, for any topic you, uh, you have. Um, it doesn't have to be that fancy. It, it should work. Um, and a lot of uh, teachers I work with that creating escape room think, oh, it, I can't share this. This is not nice. I do, it doesn't look flashy, but it's, uh, that's not necessary. So that's just one of the, the tips. Thanks, Inga. Pangiotis? Yeah, I can add to what Inga said. So uh, because my students, they're not game design students. They're UX people, OK, so they like this kind of game design background. So what has to be said from the get go is we are not going to be assessing the quality of your escape room. We're assessing the process that you follow to design that. So don't worry about the production values. OK, it might be just pen and paper. As long as the process that you follow to design, that is what we've been doing in the class, following design with design thing, that's fine. And that makes students more relaxed and willing to think outside the box and, and uh, experiment. Otherwise, if they do know that it has to be like this, then they kind of stay focused and they don't explore things. And in design thing, you want people to try out all the wild ideas. So let them know that we're not assessing the quality of your game. Don't worry about the uh, production values. I think that's a good tip, especially now with uh, AI, you can do so many things. So fast, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of AI anyway, but, uh, so they don't have to worry about that anymore, the quality values, because they can just easily do something. We're demonstrating in the class how to do things, how to use AI for that. So that makes them feel more relaxed, because what you want is 
relaxed students. They should not be stressed. Otherwise, you know, you don't get good uh, results. Thank you. Anyone else want to add anything on that before I move on to the next question? So my next question then is about thinking about the literature, you know, so I mean, we're sitting here with people who've writ written quite a lot of the literature in this area. Um, but from your perspective, um, thinking about the research that we have on the use of escape rooms in education, have you noticed any particular gaps? And I realise some of you are probably writing at this moment to fill some of those gaps. So interested to hear your thoughts. I'm happy to start this one off. Um, so I, I guess it, I, I've got a bit of a list, so do stop me whenever. Um, so I think some of it is about the impact over time and the impact at scale. So I get again, there are quite a lot of small case studies and um, and it's just, I, again, with all kinds of game based learning, it's the effect of novelty and it's the effect of, of, for different types of students. So. I think there's lots of evidence that as one offs, <laughs> they can work really well, um, but it's how you would do that um, over time and at scale. Um, I think there's also, I mean, I know Rochelle is, knows much more about this than me and we'll probably pick up on it, but I think we're also missing a trick with thinking about the design of the digital escape room and the different ways in which digital can be brought in um, and that be both in hybrid and both in sort of digital forms. But I think there's a, a lot more work that could be done there. Again, thinking about sort of inclusion, how you engage people who are not physically located, which are sort of physically co-located. Um, and I think there's a whole lot of stuff that needs unpicking there. So those would be the kind of two biggies for me. I think what I've read and I kind of brushed up again this week, I think this is not new in probably any literature, but really experimental design and, and putting people into different test groups and doing perhaps a simulation in my world of healthcare versus an escape room or various types of learning activities to compare the outcomes. I think that we, we all like to see the the benefits, but I think comparing them to other potential learning options is one. I think also to based on what you're looking for, you know, obviously learning outcomes and the, those continuing as well as perhaps behavioral change. We've I've helped with one in um, a hospital environment about fall reduction and do do that. Does that actually change their behavior? their documentation, et cetera, from that time on, I think is another thing. I do think the concept, I have considered the concept of an escape room that is threaded throughout an entire course over a semester. So different strategies for including game-based design throughout uh, things and then evaluating that over uh, a time as well would be helpful. And I do think things about when people ask for help and when they don't, I have, and the competition, even if they're not competing against one another, they, but I won first and I told them at the beginning, you didn't, nobody wins first. We all just win if we get out. So, um, you know, those kinds of factors that impact uh, things as well. And then some too on when you're part of a team, but the team does well and you don't know the stuff, but the team does well and you are, have this false sense of security that you know things when you don't. So I think there's there's little elements of, of an existing room that, you know, the factors you see, the way a team interacts and things as well. And, um, and then the extent, uh, you know, expanding escape rooms. And then one other thing I found too, I think is how we define an escape room and those tasks is quite curious. You know, there are so many different types of tasks. So are we talking about the same thing? As well as I think, as some have mentioned, which particular puzzle types are appropriate for certain elements and outcomes and goals and um, things. I think that would be interesting to really study. I mean, I think this could be the global study, you know, of how, how we define those and what are the best puzzle types. And go and you go. Yeah, I was wondering. Um, I don't. I don't know if uh, about a gap or something, but I was wondering if if we have um, uh, an evaluation uh, about when a student or a group of students plays a, a escape room or create one. 
when or do, do I learn more about the subject? For, for example, if it's around the subject, um, I don't know if there is any research like that, but I, I would be really uh, curious to know that because in my practice, I see that uh, most escape rooms, digital escape rooms are created for the students and not by the students. So, but it's just a question. And Jotis, given you've got student designing, do you want to follow up on that? Uh, yeah, actually, what I think it is missing, and I'd really like to know that is, if people actually design smaller uh, escape rooms, so uh, let's say, you know, 50 minutes, escape room 30 minutes, but they run, let's say, every every other week or something like that. So like a TV show, a serial story, and whether that thing actually works compared to just a one-off thing that happens uh, during a uh, assessment towards the end of the semester. So I'd like to know that because that would be quite hel helpful to know which approach to follow, which one works best for whatever reason. So that is what I think it's missing there and li I'd like to see. Thank you. Jenny, Rochelle, any thoughts? I'll just come in and say uh, uh, I agree very much with what Panagiotis has said there. It's about, uh, you know, where do we best use these tools? Because, you know, they are time consuming to build. So um, it would be great to have more evidence about where is the best use of them. And the other thing I'm quite interested in is the impact of and I think one of the speakers has already touched on this, the impact of escape rooms uh, longitudinally over time. Um, because in medicine, we use uh, case-based learning a lot. And if you look at um, the literature around case-based learning, it shows that uh, by approaching um, concepts, ideas, content matter in a very small group and active way, it can really consolidate facts. So students will, will retain uh, knowledge longer than through just traditional lectures. And um, so I wonder, would escape games, you know, it, it seems a very similar um, recipe or set of ingredients, um, if we could measure them over time to see what impact there was for, for uh, knowledge retention and critical skills and um, 12 months, three years down the line. I completely agree. And I think uh, I think this is probably think something we all have assumed, but I think a lot of the literature is about perception and enjoyment of the escape room and I loved doing that. It was great, it was fun and very little on for us, you know, the, the for me, clinical reasoning, critical thinking skills, higher level uh, skill and thought processing that occurs because it is so very difficult to measure those things. And again, as Nick has said, can one session do that? Um, and as Pangiata said, could maybe multiple sessions develop that over time too? So just coming in here as well, um, as Nick said, I, I'm very interested in looking at digital escape rooms. I'm actually doing a PhD exploring the educational potential of uh, digital escape rooms. So that's a gap that I think we have that I'm hoping that I will be able to find some information and potentially provide some information on. Um, I know that somebody else mentioned about defining escape rooms and its tasks completely agree. I think we also need to do a bit of work on understanding like where crossovers happen. So we currently have a situation where we have, you know, in-person escape rooms and we have digital, but we also have hybrid. Um, and it's at what point which becomes which um, and what difference it makes when you add, you know, digital elements into a physical escape room, for example. Um, I've done a really cool one recently that had um, NFC tags in it that unlocked a door, which in theory is digital. And I thought that that was like a really interesting use. Um, and it's how we are also looking to, you know, commercial escape rooms as well and being inspired by them in like an educational context. I think that there is more work that could benefit the community more broadly if we you know, show our working out a little bit. There's lots of research that comes at it from different perspectives, which is to be expected because it's very interdisciplinary um, and exciting and people are implementing it in different ways. But I don't think there's a huge amount of 
people sharing their own failings and their own experiences with it. Like we we talk about the good things and we can sometimes reflect on the things that are difficult. But as somebody who is actively researching in this area, I want to know about how people are iterating. I want to know about the ugly bits. I want to know about the the struggles they've overcome and how they've got over those barriers. Um, the stuff that's come up this morning about EDI and role play and potential there. I think there's a lot we can do with inclusivity and using escape rooms as tools for including people. Um, as with all games, there's lots of opportunity there. Um, and yeah, like th there's so much. I will stop talking because there's so much, but it's really exciting to me and it's good to be in this area at this time. Thanks, Rochelle. And maybe just picking up on a point that you made and Nick mentioned earlier about that inclusion piece. So have you, I, any of you either already thought about inclusion in your evaluations or looking forward, what might you pick up on if you're particularly looking at that EDI equality, diversity and inclusion piece? So for me, it goes wider than evaluation and it, and it goes wider than escape rooms. I guess it's thinking about all forms of play, that playing games tends to be designed by people who like playing games. And it's just actively thinking through what are the different ways in which people can choose to engage. So if in an escape room, a very obvious example is that people might engage with different types of puzzles, um, which can be designed to play to the escape room's advantage. But it's uh, and someone picked up one of the earlier sessions about if there's a lot of text and a lot of reading that might and that's the only route through something that might then disengage people. Um, and and the escape room is difficult because it's only an hour or an hour, night, whatever. Um, but it's kind of a microcosm for the whole thing. So if you've got people who would much rather be big picture people or people that would rather sort of manage. Uh, I've got a friend who I do escape rooms with. Um, who some of you in the room might recognise, and he's the one that always does the weird thing that you don't expect anyone's going to do, and yet it turns out to solve. It's the thing that, that unlocks it for us. And like, why did you press that? Okay, but it works. Um, so he's designing things in for just the whole diversity of people to play in different ways, as well as people who don't want to play. And I think this is there's also people who really don't like escape rooms, and, and not just for the the claustrophobic side of it, just for the whole idea of. I remember working with like my old manager several jobs ago, and trying when the escape rooms just came out and explaining them to him, and him going, "So what? I, I'm in a room with with other people for an hour, and I can't get out. I've got to solve puzzles, and the look of horror of that that combination of things. So it's kind of well, what then can you can you give if this is a, a compulsory activity because it because it's a teaching activity and I'm not saying it shouldn't be but it's then really thinking through anything that we do because people that design play tend to be playful how can you design and involve in your evaluations people that that don't like doing this sort of thing I think that's really important and often gets kind of missed out in our considerations I think that's a great point. I want to add maybe a couple of things. I did an escape room as part of a conference for nurses who are educators for staff in hospitals. And we were in simulation rooms with one way glass. And in one of the teams, there was a, a who, participant who was clearly not amused, did not want to be there, look of disgust on her face, not participate in all of these things. And so that was so fascinating. But then the same participant wrote, designed, implemented an escape room, published it with some colleagues. So it is so curious how she looked like this was the most awful thing in the world. And so I don't know, maybe there's some that are more on Pangeatis' side, they would design it, but have no participation. Thank you so much. Also, in some things, I don't know that we had enough data to support this, but in doing it with hospital staff rather than my tra usually traditional age undergraduate students of a diversity of ages and, mm -hmm. and are there differences mm -hmm. based on um, you know, age or learning style, that kind of thing. It, it did seem that there was some of that, that maybe more the um, Gen Xers may be more, more interested than others. So that would be interesting. Also, the, the diversity of a group, you know, and what are the elements that each person brings to a group that's diverse, that makes it a strong group, the ideas of leadership and groups and how um, 
too many leaders problematic, not having a leader problematic. Um, those kinds of things are uh, curious, curious things as well. So. So folks, I promised I would give a chance to pick up some things out of the chat. So the first thing that I'm picking up is asking about frameworks. So evaluation frameworks, if you've got any particular ones that you use, would recommend. The example given is something called League, used for corporate evaluation. Not sure if you're familiar with that. Um, but yeah, any thoughts on evaluation frameworks? I might not remember all of the names in my field of nursing. There's, and I, this might go elsewhere too. It's a little early here in the US. Um, the Kirkpatrick model of, of evaluation, kind of the perception based up to um, real change, I think is something to consider and where we are on that. And also what's existing in literature already. It seems like a lot of what I see in escape rooms are, I did this neat thing, these were the neat tasks, which is valuable to people, but then it's it's mostly perception after that. So those kinds of levels and then levels of critical thinking um, as well and the elements of critical thinking you see when using. And I, I'm not remembering the name. I'll see if I can find it in the background. Thanks, Piana. Jenny, I saw you nodding away when Kirkpatrick was mentioned. Are there others that you use I, as well? Oh, oh, we're all so helped here. So, Brianna, I totally get the Kirkpatrick's and it was what I had in my head. I, I mean, I guess I, I think that's a very broad question because I think there are a range of different frameworks. I mean, if you if you go in and just look at, you know, Google escape escape room framework, you may not get a huge number of hits, but it's about digging deeper and maybe even pausing the idea that you're looking at an escape game. Are, are you looking at learning are you you know what's your learning theory what's your pedagogical model uh, is it experiential learning are you looking at um you know uh kind of like my own was community of inquiry um i mean most escape games have a range of different pedagogical theories that are uh, explaining or modeling the learning that's taken place and you can use those as frameworks there are frameworks associated with the different pedagogies um I know as soon as I say the word pedagogical framework, it just turns everybody off. But, you know, go back to the theory of learning and what frameworks associated with that uh, can you find? And Jenny, I think I recall you talking about that last year and it was very good. Um, I another one is um, a Lassiter clinical judgment model, and that's again for healthcare, but talks about the um, and also sometimes in our area, we talk about noticing, interpreting and res responding and reflecting in healthcare when we're noticing with patients and the, that kind of thing. But I, I could see potential for that to also relate to escape rooms. There's a concept of noticing, interpreting, responding and reflecting. And maybe that is what care, you know, is our, our approach to things and with the reflecting perhaps happening in debriefing or with other reflection as well. Thank you. So I'll pick up any other questions coming out the chat if anyone wants to pop something in. And um, before I give you a last question on evaluation, there was one that isn't evaluation specific, but I'm going to abuse the position of chair and ask you it anyway. And um, so right early on, one of our colleagues was asking um, just about your choice of puzzle. How do you choose the puzzles you use? Now, I know you've got a wealth of experience here that that colleague will appreciate. So would anyone like to respond? Uh, can I on, answer that? So first of all, uh, because we follow this kind of design thinking principles, we empathize with the users. So when we get to know the users and also includes extreme users, which is, you know, the very uh, experienced and the, I have never done this in my life. I probably don't want to do that again ever. So you get to talk to them and you ask them to, you know, just play something, you introduce them to something, if they're not familiar with the, the whole uh, concept. And then you just try to pitch out some ideas about puzzles and see what they feel more comfortable about. And another thing, use AI. Personally, I use ChatGPT uh, to ask you to suggest ideas about puzzles, but you know that different ideas that focus on different parts of the brain or you know different kind of uh, uh, emotional intelligences and all that. So you kind of this variety, get this pool, and then you just play test that and see what works based on the feedback that you get. Because if it's also you know the design, if you involve the actual users the players while you're designing that like a cool designing session then you get to see what 
uh, appeals more to them, and that can inform you and your design decision later on. But I would say, especially now with the use of AI, you can you know brainstorm it. Yeah? It's it's you know so just having a very a nice body to you know talk all the time. So that's that's what we use. I don't have a very um, academic sounding answer, but sometimes it's what works. <laughs> you know, you have an idea of what you want your learners to be able to do or learn, and you go, how in the world could I include this? And there's certain things that are very difficult to include. And it is sometimes hard to get at the higher level Bloom's taxonomy of, of analysis and application sometimes. So. Uh, sometimes there's just like, okay, could I use, you know, you have different locks and you have kind of a, a resource pool. I kind of write down my resource options and ideas and I Google ideas and just kind of get some brainstorming ideas. And then sometimes it's like, what could work in this context? And there's some things that are not appropriate uh, for escape rooms. I find that it, it just won't work quite right or it requires um, a resource of a person and sometimes you have that, sometimes you don't um, to analyze, are they getting it or not to give them a next clue to move on the escape room. I think that's a really important point. Context is huge. Um, the, the other thing with that as well is coming back to that inclusivity, trying to make a judgment and understand the people that you have in a group. Um, and I know that's much more difficult when you have you know, a commercial setting because you potentially don't know who you're going to have in a group, but in a classroom, you tend to know who your students are um, and designing for them as well. Um, also, I think when you engage in escape rooms yourself, you will have experiences and then think, OK, this puzzle is not happening. For example, I took my nieces and nephew to an escape room. It was horrible history themed. I thought this is going to be a breeze, lovely, easy theme. Couldn't have been more wrong. But I experienced in this escape room the most traumatic puzzle I have ever experienced. So you had to learn how to speak chicken language. And they played a series of pecks and clucks, which sounded exactly the same. And you had to figure out a code that was a number from the pecks and the clucks. Very clever puzzle. So, so difficult. <laughs> Luckily, one of my nieces was able to like really focus. The other challenge was this tape was on loop. So we had no idea where the start and end was. Um, so I think genuinely you will have some experiences with some puzzles and just think, that's not happening. I don't think I would ever do something like that because I don't think that's accessible, but also because I'm kind of traumatized. <laughs> I, I have to add to, I went to a family friendly escape room with my family and I think my son was seven or eight at the time. And we went in and you had to do the lights. And then when you did the lights, there was lightning, the sound of thunder, and then a full sized casket opened and there's a full sized um, skeleton in there. My son screamed solidly for two minutes, ran to the other room and would never come back in. And the whole concept of escape rooms from then on out for quite a while, not an issue, not a thing. Pangiatis had provided some examples, some fun things to do at home last year. Try to have him do with them, do it with them. He would do a few and then he would like it was it was very traumatic. So there is marketing your escape room correctly and knowing what the per previous perhaps traumatic experiences of people have been before that. So definitely not family friendly. OK, I'm going to come to Inga and then I'm going to give you the last question coming back to evaluation. So Inga. Yeah, for digital uh, escape rooms, uh, we created an escape room and we uh, noticed that one of the puzzles or more puzzles are very difficult. Um, so what we added, and that's in an in an phys a physical escape room as well, is uh, we added hints and make sure that they always can could go further. Um, so in this case, uh, we we take a puzzle that we think that's appropriate, <laughs> but because of the hints we added, uh, they always can get out, and they can create uh, take the hints, uh, but then they have uh, less points. So there is a sort of um, yeah, competition uh, in that they don't want to have less points than the others. Um, so they trying to solve the puzzle. But uh, yeah, the, the main thing is make sure that they always can come out if that's the goal. If the goal is just get as far as you can in this escape room, then you don't have to do that. 
Thanks, Inga. So last question for our panel um, and kind of building on Rochelle's comment about show your working, share your mistakes. Have you got any advice on how best to disseminate your evaluation findings? How do we widen this conversation? I tend to obviously look at um, journals in my profession or things related to simulation and gaming and the bigger context involved um, as well, and then see what has been published. And I do the the easy email the editor to see if they're interested. Sometimes I don't get a, re a good response, but oftentimes I do, or they will say sometimes it's too saturated in that area, so you look elsewhere. So that saves you time in, in rating an article. It's very pointed to a particular journal that's not um, useful. And then obviously if it doesn't go well, taking um, defeat as a way to learn and grow uh, for for that particular journal or another. And sometimes I've gone back to journals and on various topics and said, no, I think that you misinterpreted this. I think this really would be perfect fit. So sometimes fighting back a little bit is helpful too. Thanks, Brianna. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, I can. So I, I think, again, sort of Rochelle's pointed to it, but I think it's the openness, both of the community to share things that don't work and in terms of where we think of publishing and how we make that as open as possible and, and then as accessible as possible, um, both in terms of academic publishing, but also publishing things that might not, I suppose, might be interesting outside the range of enthusiasts. So to different educational sectors, to parents, to students themselves, um, and just making sure that, that this doesn't become a kind of niche academic field, but has much, much wider reach. And also having diversity in where and how you share. Um, I have gained so much from listening to podcasts and also, you know, talking on podcasts occasionally. Um, and I'm not saying that that's the only medium to do that, but also recognising that there are, you know, groups, there are, you know, places like this, there are so many different interdisciplinary places. I'm currently in a little sort of rabbit hole with Jessie Shell, who is a game designer who used to work as a Disney Imagineer, um, who basically started out his career just making random Easter eggs in Disney for his own enjoyment. And there's so much to be learned from like random places like well, I don't think Nick said random so much, but just places you wouldn't necessarily expect. So being open to doing that exploration beyond the bounds. Um, so, yeah, that, that I guess. And just being open to finding surprises and also making surprises for other people to find. I think that's the other thing. It's kind of it. it should be a conversation. It should be reciprocal. It doesn't just need to be one sided. And I might add to professional organizations and meetings that like like this in person or otherwise um, great way to network and create collaborations um, for the future. It's a great way to also share and just run your escape room there. I also as I, I've done them for my son's fourth grade class, I've done it for a fifth grade group at a church. And so, you know, I don't know that those literature areas have a lot on this, too. So there might be some things in K-12 education or others that are other ways to share that perhaps are a little more diverse for us. Okay, hey, so we are over time, folks. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap us up here now. Um, I would like to thank every member of our panel, Inga, Rochelle, Pangiotis, Brianna, Nick, Jenny. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise here. There's a whole raft of comments in the chat and um, what you might want to engage with. It's been a very busy chat in the background. Um, but I think, you know, leaving this session, a couple of things jump out. That call to action to share the things that don't quite work as much as the things that do to maybe start exploring this longitudinally. How do we explore um, the, the, the macro as well as the micro in um, our evaluations? But most of all, that point you made, Nick, you know, Escape rooms for education should still be fun. We don't have to value every single thing that we do. So it's that finding the balance, 
where's the right time to evaluate, what's the right thing to evaluate. So thanks to everyone who's joined and particularly please join me in thanking our panel again.